the mission continues. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. At our convention last year, which seems like a hundred years ago, I told a story about Michael Curry. We were in Providence for a large national gathering of deacons. Michael was giving the keynote address and he was preaching about St. Paul. He said, wherever St. Paul went, there was a revolution, a revolution. When he went to Corinth, there was a revolution. When he went to Philippi, there was a revolution. And then Michael started pointing out bishops in the crowd. He would say the bishop's name, and then he would say, what would it look like if there were a revolution in your diocese? And he'd name the diocese. He did this four times. Name of the bishop, and what it would look like if there was a revolution in your diocese. Then he calls me out. Doug, what would it look like? Oh, wait, there's already a revolution going on in Western Massachusetts. I was never so proud of our diocese. Now it's a year later. We find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic. Stress and anxiety are everywhere. Clergy and lay leaders feel it, as do healthcare workers, teachers, parents of school-aged children, owners of small businesses, the unemployed, and so many others. The pain I felt the most has been our inability to be with our loved ones when they were dying, and then having to severely limit the number of mourners who could attend the funeral. The Episcopal Church is far from perfect, but something we're really good at is pastoral care for the sick. In the beautiful prayer book, Burial, where we say that life is changed, not ended. And into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant. And there's so much more about the church that we miss, like seeing each other in person, Holy Communion, choirs. Add in an election that does not seem to end. In a deeply divided country, with two vastly different visions for our future. So what does a revolutionary diocese like Western Massachusetts do in this deeply challenging time? The revolution, the Jesus revolution, always begins with a radical commitment to faith. You know, I have three go-to prayers that I say these days. One comes from the prayer book, for use on All Saints Day. But I pray it every day. In the multitude of your saints, you have surrounded us with a great cloud of witnesses that we might run with endurance the race that is set before us and together with them receive the crown of glory that never fades away. It's a prayer that speaks to our time because we have a race now that we didn't pick, but it's the race that is set before us. And we don't run it alone. We're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses that testify to the faith and to staying faithful. Who is in your cloud of witnesses? Bring them into your mind, into your soul. They are running this race with you. My other go-to prayer is from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He wrote this in 1968, but I think it's so perfect for 2020. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts, minds, and souls, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail. To be with us in our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and our lying down, in our moments of joy and sorrow. Dr. King preached over and over again about blessed assurance. Blessed assurance that God is always present. And he felt that presence most clearly and deeply in the most fearful and anxious moments of his life. And here's one more. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future 
to a known God. We boldly proclaim we know God in the person of Jesus. Jesus who forgives, heals, feeds, lifts up, blesses, dies and rises. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You are more resilient than you think because you are in the hands of a death-conquering God. Resurrection is not just for the end of life. Resurrection happens throughout life when we fall and we get up again. And the revolution will mean love of neighbor. You know, we did a survey of our churches asking how they are addressing the needs of their neighborhoods during the COVID-19 pandemic. What's gone on in these last six months? 39 of our 51 churches responded. And here's what love of neighbor looks like. 37 congregations have assisted their local food bank. 28,000 meals were prepared and served by our congregations. 22 congregations collaborated with mission partners by giving financial support totaling $138,000. Eight people were sheltered. 1,200 care packages for people experiencing homelessness. 105 backpacks were made for those leaving prison. Rector's discretionary funds accessed for the vulnerable, over $40,000. Over 1,600 masks were made and donated. Over 50,000 diapers and hygiene products given away. Hundreds of gift cards to local grocery stores given away. Several parish halls used for Wi-Fi by students who do not have that at home. Home repairs for five families. A farmer's market that served 6,400 customers. 50 blankets for children in neonatal care at Bay State. 200 school uniforms for children in Haiti. And that was all done by individual churches. On a diocesan level, through Human to Human, we are supporting lunches for veterans, walking together in Worcester, laundry love, and recovery programs. Living out Matthew 25 is part of the revolution in Western Massachusetts. The revolution demands racial justice and dismantling white supremacy. For several years now, we've had a very active beloved community commission here. The tragic events of 2020 have shown a light on 400 years of racial injustice and made their work more important than ever. You know, more than 10 of our parishes have actively engaged in education programs such as Sacred Ground. We offered a webinar to our clergy and lay preachers about how to preach racial justice. Early on in the pandemic, Laura Everett, the executive director of the Mass Council of Churches, said that she feared that at the end of this, only wealthy white churches would be left standing. She started a one church fund to help black urban churches from a variety of denominations. Our diocese donated $15,000. And there's so much more to do. Come Holy Spirit. Next week, I will ordain two transitional deacons. Both are people of color. And we have doubled down on our commitment to starting Latino faith communities, Episcopal Latino faith communities. There'll be more about this later in the convention. You know, if there's a patron saint for this time, someone we could take from the great cloud of witnesses to be with us in this time of shining a light on racial justice, one of them is a local saint, Jonathan Daniels, born and raised in Keene, New Hampshire. He went to the Virginia Military Institute and there heard a call to ordain ministry. He went to Episcopal Divinity School in the 1960s. Dr. King invited clergy from the North to come and work with him in the South. With other students, Daniels went to Alabama as a volunteer for a few days. At first, he was not particularly moved by the experience, but he missed the bus going back to Boston. It meant he had to stay another week, and in that week, 
he recognized the injustice of segregation in the Jim Crow laws. When he returned back to the seminary, he asked for a year off to work in Alabama. He did great work there, integrating the Episcopal Church in Selma. With others, he was arrested at a protest and jailed in Haynesville, Alabama. They were released after about a week and went to buy sodas at a local store. A man with a gun stopped them and aimed his gun at a black teenager named Ruby Sales. Jonathan realized he was going to shoot, so he threw himself in front of her, taking a bullet that killed him. A martyr at 26. His writings include this. I began to know in my bones and sinews that I had been truly baptized into the Lord's death and resurrection. With them, the black men and the white men, with all of life, in him whose name is above all names, that all races and nations will shout, we are indelibly and unspeakably one. Indelibly and unspeakably one. Jonathan is now in the great cloud of witnesses. In 2020, we've witnessed unprecedented climate events, showing us that climate change is not in the future, it's now. Because of the prophetic voice of Margaret Bullitt Jonas and of others, our diocese has long been a leader in creation care. That work is urgent. During the pandemic, more guns have been purchased than any six-month time frame since records have been kept. Bishops United Against Gun Violence continue to work diligently for gun safety, for gun safety through legislation and inviting gun manufacturers to become part of the solution. I've said it often in 2020, although most of our church buildings are closed, the mission of the church is wide open. I'm so inspired by our clergy and lay leaders who have adapted over and over again to provide pastoral care and worship. I get it. I get how hard this is. And there are more challenging months to come. Thank you for your resilience, your commitment to doing the most loving and safe thing. Whatever the tragic toll of this virus will ultimately be, the numbers will be less because of you. Learning the technology of getting together for worship on Zoom or YouTube Live or video streaming is another big challenge. Thank you for engaging that challenge. And to help you in that effort, we are starting a new financial initiative. From diocesan funds, we will reimburse any parish that upgrades their digital communication capacities up to $2,000. We want to encourage you in proclaiming the gospel with the best resources available. And the revolution is continuing in our diocese through the development of lay leaders. Jane Griesbach and Meredith Ward are teaching 40 people how to lead morning prayer. Rich Simpson and a team are training 12 new lay preachers with another class of 12 to follow. Jenny Gregg has led the Loving the Questions program for several years. It's an in-depth process to help participants discern how they are called to serve. Most years, there are five to 10 people in this program. In 2020, there are 26. And I'm grateful to Pam Mott, who's promoted the training of coaches in our diocese. We all need coaches to help us make decisions in this ever-changing environment. And now they're available as a holy resource. We live in hard times, but the church has gone through hard times before. The church was born in hard times. St. Paul describes it in his second letter to the church of Corinth. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. For it is God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. 
We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. I'll end this convention address with one more saint and what the early church did in tough times. It's at the end of the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. A man named Joseph of Cyprus joined the apostles. And the apostles renamed him. They gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. You see, the apostles knew what they needed. They needed a son of encouragement. We live in such challenging times. What would happen if everyone here at this convention promises to be a son or daughter of encouragement in our churches, in our communities, in our families? It might be revolutionary. The mission continues. Surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, we run with endurance the race that is set before us. And together with them, we see the crown of glory that never fades away. Amen.